want to be obedient to him for sure. So thanks for letting me talk a little bit. Um, this morning, as we were um, in our time of worship at the end, there was just this prophetic time where we were singing in the spirit. And as I was singing in the spirit, it was really exciting because scripture after scripture began to just appear in my mind. And scriptures I never would lace together at all. And so I just began to sing those scriptures, and we're singing those, and um, they just trailed together. And in the last three seconds, I was able to write down all five of them. So that's God. He, he knows how to pull those together. My short-term memory is, well, I have the capacity of a snail. I do. I've got nothing. But Holy Spirit quickens things to our mind. I want you to take a look at Matthew chapter 5, verse or 25, verse 1. This was the, the one that just started to pop up towards the end of that prophetic time of worship. Um, it's the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. It says, At that time the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. That's not me, necessarily. <laughs> I have 10 pounds of potatoes in my back seat. There were 20, but I took 10 out and left the other 10. <laughs> That's the kind of person I am when it comes to my daily life. But when it comes to my spiritual life, I'm not reckless like that. I might forget stuff in my back seat. I might have messy things going on in my world. But when it comes to Jesus, I'm not playing around. I'm not going to leave potatoes in my back seat or whatever it is. I'm going to be focused on the things of God. I'm going to show up with my lamp ready. Yes. They had extra oil with them. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. And they all became drowsy and they fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. And then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, hey, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No. They replied, there may not be enough for both of us, both us and you. Instead, you go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived, and the virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. I believe that that is a call to wake up and pay attention. These were virgins. They were pure and they were careful with their walk with God, but they weren't careful enough, were they? Careful enough to bring a lamp, careful enough to keep themselves pure, but not careful enough to have extra. And we are in a time and a season as a church and as a body throughout our nation, I believe, where we have to have more than enough. We have to have enough for ourselves, and then we have to have more to pour out on the world. If you look at those ten virgins... Um, think of them as Christians. The extra oil is important for them to share. But you'll notice that the Christian didn't share the oil with the other Christian. Because you know what? You have to get your own oil. I, I can't give you mine. I wish that I could. It would make ministry so much easier. I could just gather enough oil and I could just fill your cup. That would be awesome. I could just help you. I can't do that for you. I can help non-Christians because they don't have the wherewithal to get it without Jesus, right? Yes. Do we get that? But I can't help you. Tim can't help you. I, I can't pour it into you. I can't give it to you. And when the bridegroom comes, if your lamp is not trimmed, you're in terrible trouble. You, you may make it into heaven, but there is this thing that's going to happen. There is this thing in the end times that's going to occur that is going to be passionate and it's going to be fulfilling, and it's going to be life-changing as we see revival poured out. And some of us, and I'm not going to say some of us because I don't plan to miss it. I won't. I'd rather die. When an end-time revival comes, if you have not trimmed your lamp, you're in trouble. You'll miss it. You'll always feel like you're an inch behind everybody else. But they'll be seeing things in the prophetic and angels and visions and they'll be being used to see people be saved and they will be feeding the hungry and they will be changing the world and facing persecution and you will be trying to find some oil. Yes. I don't want to be that way. We are giving up our life so that we can be a part of the greatest harvest that has ever occurred, a harvest of souls and God has given us as an American church an absolutely difficult, heartbreaking job. 
the people of America are hard and they're jaded to the things of God. They believe that being a good person is enough. Showing up at church is enough. If you don't know that's true, just look around. I see it all the time with my students. They are nice little people. I love them. They're so dear. But not every one of them is going to heaven, even though they're nice and they're dear. There is so much more that God requires, and we have the mouth to speak it, but so often we're just limping around with just enough oil. Man, just enough for you. Awesome. How nice for you. But in the end time, God will use those who have their oil and have stored up more oil and have trimmed their wicks and are waiting and are ready. Mm -hmm. And those who are in the body of Christ, I really believe there's going to be a parallel in those dat last days. There's going to be a church that is moving forward aggressively, changing lives. And there's going to be this quiet, well-behaved little thing on the sidelines trying to do something and doing absolutely nothing except for lead people aside into traditions and ideas and clubism. When a world is lost and dying and going to hell, I believe that it is the end times, and I believe that we cannot be unprepared for those times. If you look over in Luke chapter 12, and by the way, this is really intimidating, <laughs> so thank you for being encouraging. Uh, Luke 12, 35. Be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. This is Luke chapter 12, verse 35. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready. Even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night, even if he comes at 3 a.m. or 6 a.m. is what that means. But understand this, or midnight and 3, 3 a.m., excuse me. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have not have let his house be broken in, into. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. I love Peter. He's going to ask the same thing the church asks. Um, are you telling this parable to us or to everybody? It's for everybody. <laughs> Pay attention. You don't know when he's coming. That's how we stay prepared. That reminds me of something I do in my classroom. If you want to make sure everybody's paying attention, don't call on the people who raise their hands. Don't do it. You have popsicle sticks with their names on them. And when you ask a question, you pull out a popsicle stick, and nobody knows who's going to be asked, so everybody's paying attention. So if you ask them, they'll be ready to answer. It's kind of the same concept. Jesus says, you know what? I'm not going to tell you when I come because then you would just sit around quietly until it was really close and then you go do the work. So we have to, he knows our human nature. We don't know when he's going to come. So we have to be ready all the time. Be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. Immediacy has become a thing of the past in the American church. We're too busy checking ourselves and fixing ourselves and making sure that maybe we really did hear from God. You know what? Let's just hear from God and act upon it and let God deal with the results. Open the door to him immediately. When he gives that prophetic thing, when he speaks into your heart, when he tells you something, let's have a sense of immediacy because what you practice, you'll do. I will never forget as a young woman, we were racing cars foolishly we were racing cars into town we live 10 miles out of town uh there's five corners between my house and and uh the town and they're 30 mile 25 mile an hour turns like this and oftentimes you can cut over into the other side and make those turns so my friend had gone ahead he had a little toyota and he had popped a fifth gear into that he had made it so it was five gears so that he could go even faster and we stupidly decided that it would be awesome to see who could get to town first and my brother, not foolishly at this point, he said, I'm not going to do it. But they had already left. And they were racing into town, and they made one corner, and then they didn't make the second corner. And they crashed, uh, flipped end over end three times, side by side, two times, threw them out of the car. And we came upon them a few minutes later and called the ambulance, which takes 20 to 30 minutes to get out to a place like that. It is so remote, very hard to find. And I remember my friend Michael laying in the ditch, cursing at the top of his lungs. He went to church, but he only played church. And his habit was to curse and talk in foul ways. 
And so when he was unconscious, his unconscious mind did what his, unco what his conscious was always doing. He fulfilled his habit. And he was cursing. And I remember just whacking him on the shoulder, even though he was obviously not in need of being smacked. I was like, Michael, what if you were to die in this moment? Come back to yourself. Don't act like this. Now, he's gone on to serve the Lord and is a wonderful man of God. But I learned in that moment that what we practice is what we do in crisis. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be ready for these last day's events, you need to practice now. If you want to be a person who has a, a terrible tragedy come upon you and you begin to curse and you begin to fuss and you begin to complain and you begin to whine, practice that. But if you want to be that person that when those end times come and these end time events are upon us, if you, if you saw what happened in Nepal, if you would see what's happening with the police and the rioting in our nation and the uprise of, of bitterness between the races in our country, would you agree that it's the last days? So we've got to practice what it is that we want to be our response to those things that happen to us. If we don't, our habits will overtake us. And when those times come, we'll fall into those habits. You think, oh, no, I wouldn't. I would tidy myself up. I would tidy myself up. You won't. Human nature is human nature. Maybe you would. I hope you would. Maybe it would go well for you. What a terrible risk to take. What a risk to take. How do you know what you might do? Perhaps you would be the one laying in the ditch cursing because that's what you've always done. Complaining or fussing or whining or missing it or ignoring it. I don't want to be that person and sometimes I do fail. I falter and I'm like that. But I'm working my salvation out with fear and trembling. I'm coming before God in repentance on a daily basis. I'm living a lifestyle of repentance. God has brought me low in these last few years. He has brought me to my knees and on my face and he has humbled me and he has broken me for the purpose that he could raise me up to do his work. I want you to turn over to Joel chapter 2. It's kind of towards the end of the Old Testament. One of the most beautiful passages in the Bible. And each of these were ones that the Lord was using prophetically as we sang in worship this morning at the end. Joel chapter 2, 28. says, and afterward, Joel 2, 28. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This scripture can be parallel both before the rapture and after the rapture. Parts of it can come in on both sides. I believe that we are in the end times, and as end times people, he says he will pour out his spirit. We must have sons and daughters in the church so that they can prophesy. Amen? We've got to have sons and daughters. We've got to have old men staying in their churches so that they can dream dreams. We've got to have young men to see those visions. We've got to have servants, men and women, to have the spirit poured out on them. Yes. Because God will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Do we not see it now? I perceive it. I perceive it. I've never seen anything like this before. My family was a family that always watches the news. It was like a sport. It was really the only sport we had. But, you know, we would read the newspaper and we would watch the news. I've never seen anything like this. Is it just me? Or are we having more natural disasters? Are we having more rioting? Are we having more problems between the races in America than we've, we've had for so many years? Are we seeing persecution against Christians that has not come about for so many years. We have not seen executions like what we're seeing in Syria. We, we have not seen countries like Nigeria come to this level of mess. You have to look at this and say, wake up. Wake up. It is the last days and we don't have time to just have enough oil for now. We have to be a prepared people, ready to immediately open the door, and that's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us knowing the word. I know it isn't fair. Some people can just memorize the word. That's how it works for me. I, I'm dyslexic, and I have other learning disabilities, so I learn to read by memorizing. So I can memorize anything, and it'll just come like this. My husband doesn't memorize, but that's no excuse. He tacks up scriptures on his walls, and he makes himself learn them because you know what? We need oil. There just isn't, this isn't, there, there isn't any way that we can get around this because if we keep making excuses for ourselves, we'll miss it. 
Sometimes I forget things that I need to remember, but that's not a good excuse. I, I need to be ready because God wants to pour out his spirit. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about a life of repentance and humility and awe of God, a life that is dotting its I's and crossing its T's, not out of a desire for works, but out of a passion for God. If I love him, I will obey his commandments and I will follow him and I will give him everything. I won't just give him my leftovers because I believe that the spirit will be poured on my daughters and they will prophesy. I believe that the old men in our church will dream dreams and I believe that our young men will see visions. Even on those servants, men and women, the spirit will be poured out in those days. If we'll just be ready, if we'll just obey God. Isaiah chapter 60 talks about this, one of the most beautiful verses and a very easy one to memorize. If you can't memorize, you need to start tucking scriptures in your pocket. Your wallet could be full of money or it could be full of the word. Which one do you think is more likely? Get your scriptures, stick them in your wallet, stick them in your pocket, stick them someplace where you can see them, put them on your mirror until they become a part of your very being. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. I believe that we need to arise and shine because the light of God's glory is coming in powerful ways. There is going to be a last day of anointing and a power that's going to flow out, and we will arise and shine, and that glory of the Lord will rise upon us, but only if we are a ready, prepared people. God wants to visit his spirit on a church that is immediately ready, that has its lamps trimmed, that has the door ready to be opened, that is looking and watching and desiring. God desires or he requires so little of us. All he says is just be ready. Just pay attention. Just pay attention and be ready. That's all he asks. And this ties into what my husband preached this morning in Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, this all just came together in my heart and in my mind. Again, um, that was one of the ones that just, it's a call that we need to pray. Because the Church of America is asleep. The Church of America, um, you see pockets of passion arising in powerful ways. But as a whole, there's a lot of playing nice and being well behaved. And trying to do the right things and be good people and pleasing you know, being so careful not to offend people, being so careful um, to be sensitive. I, guys, when did we decide to be sensitive to people and stop being sensitive to the Spirit? The Holy Spirit is gentle and He is faithful and He is good. And if you obey Him, what you do will be gentle and faithful and good. It may not look like that, but it is that. And we can't be sensitive to people anymore when we need to be sensitive to the Spirit. Because if we don't, we grieve God's Spirit. And when we grieve God's Spirit, Spirit, He moves away. He moves away. If you do not welcome Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit does not come. I learned that in college. Holy Spirit is a gentleman. If you ask Him not to be there, He won't be there. And those aren't words they say. we say. Those are actions we do that say, you know, Holy Spirit, I'm not that interested. Ever been in the grocery store and Holy Spirit told you to do something? And you thought, oh, that's just me, and you walked away? He won't ask you next time. Repent. Say, God, I missed it. I blew it. And ask him to tell you again. Because God is looking for an end-time people who will absolutely obey God. What do you have to lose? What if you were wrong? So what? You certainly didn't hurt that person by blessing them. And God knew that you would do whatever he said, when he said it, how he said it. I know, this is not... This, this isn't playing nice or, or patty cake or, or, or being well behaved, but you're not people like that. I know a lot about you because we have loved you for 10 years. And I hope to love you for 10 more. So I know that you're not playing games. And I know that you can get this. I know that we can get this. I know yes. that we can be more than what we've been. But not if we just have enough. We're going to have to have more because the world requires it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14. For it is the light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, wake up, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. I believe in 
pockets all over the nation. We saw this when we were working with rural compassion in those times. I ran into all these pastors, and there were pastors from the most ridiculous backwoodsy places. We visited some people in Montana. I don't even know where that place is. It's, it's completely remote, and there's this huge church. And these people just going after God and the Holy Spirit. I, I don't even know. Where would the people come from? It's Montana. There's like four people there. And the church is packed out, and they're driving for 30 and 40 and 50 miles talking to those guys that are in North Dakota. What's in North Dakota? Nothing. But the man camps are there. And so man camps are where people come, and they, and they work on the pipeline or something. And they're awful. They're a mess. They're a train wreck. And so these guys came, and they, and they come in, and they said, could, could we bring them to church? And they said, you're not allowed. We're not allowed to proselytize in any way. And he just prayed that God would give them favor. And they began to let them bring their vans in and take these guys out and bring them to church. Because prostitution and fighting and all these things were rampant. Middle of nowhere. Nobody cares about what they're doing. No one will ever say, yay, Cameron, for doing that. No one will ever say, yay, to that guy in Montana. I don't remember his name. And we look at our little church and we think, well, uh, no. You're part of something a lot bigger. There are little churches like ours all over the nation that are the meat and potatoes of our country. And they're doing what we're doing. They're feeding kids and they're staying faithful and they're being a remnant because, you know, in the last days, God isn't going to come for the fancy necessarily. He's going to come for the committed. And those people may be fancy and they may be very, very humble like we are. It doesn't matter. It's all about preparedness. I want to be a part of the end time revival. I want to be ready. When Jesus returns, I want to be in the midst of revival. I want to see people saved. So when I see that, I feel like it's something that we need to be praying. Wake up, O oh sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We need to pray for our churches. As a nation, we need to pray for America, that they would wake up because they're sleeping. Our nation is sleeping. Our nation is complacent. And they've become immune to the things of God because it's all just a word. It's all just something that we wear on our shirt or on our pants. The cross of Christ. But it's so much more than that. And God wants so much more for us than that. In John chapter 8, I'm going to make sure I can find the right verse. John chapter 8, verse 31. I think this is really powerful. We, preach, we, we speak this word all the time, but I really think we might be missing it. Because we, we don't pay attention to the first half of the verse. We only say the second half. Read this verse. It will blow your mind. 831, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings... You are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We love to say that. The truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. Know that truth will set you free. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. We're clinging to those truths, and as we cling to those truths, then we can be his disciples, and then there's freedom. It's, it's, it's so strange that being uh, bound to something can bring you freedom. But that's that incredible transfer. When we are bound to God, when we are bound to his ways, then there's true freedom. Because we don't recklessly do what we choose to do. Instead, we recklessly abandon ourselves to the will of God and to his purposes and to his ways. And when we do that, then there's real freedom. We want freedom in worship. We want freedom in God's presence. But most of us are struggling to walk in the truth. And if that continues to be our way... How are we truly ready? We can't be perfect, and I certainly don't want you to take that away from what the Lord was giving me tonight because that's not where it's at. But we can be committed, and we can be faithful, and we can decide that we want to be ready with more than enough. We can decide that we're going to be in the Word. We can decide that we are going to be in prayer. We can decide that we're going to be faithful through the good times and through the bad because you know what? I think about the end time that will come. I think about our church when revival breaks out. There will be people who um, just can't stay the course with God, just with God, right? And it breaks my heart to think of any of us being on the outside looking in. And I want us to be a people who understand the time and allow ourselves or allow ourselves to be right in the center of what God is doing. And that means every one of us taking up our place in God's family 
and doing the work that God gives and being led by Holy Spirit. That's what God is looking for in an end-time church. And I believe that we are ripe for that. If we will step outside of uh, business as usual and be very countercultural, I think probably that if we do that, people will be really mad at us. <laughs> Just to let you know. I'm not sure when you said those verses came to you. Was that this morning? Well, last week when we were in worship, um, I didn't get an opportunity to share this, but the Lord laid this on me. This is in Revelation. This is Revelation 3. These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Mm -hmm. Strengthen what remains and what is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard, and hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Amen. And there's a thread that runs through God's church um, that he is trying to speak to us all to wake up to wake up, to pay attention, because this is the last times. And I'm excited to see what God will do. And I was talking about how people might be mad. Nobody likes to see authentic Christianity when they're not being authentic. It just makes them sad. But God may turn their hearts, too, if we will be truly authentic. 